town that I live in is called Bob White. It wasn't named after a man, it was named after a bird. The cliffs on the back side of my property is where the Bob White quails nested at. When the birds would call through the morning, through the evening, you could hear them throughout the valley. It echoed. It sounded like 20 birds was calling instead of one. It's been probably close to 15 years now since I've even heard a Bob White quail. This is the most biodiverse region in the whole United States, second on the globe, and you know, we're blowing it up. My grandfather and my family before me worked as underground union coal miners, and it was very hard for me to begin organizing against coal because coal had always been such a source of pride in our family. Coal is the basis for the whole economy here in West Virginia, and they very much control the employment here. There's one area that we're working on right now to preserve that is viable for wind energy, and that's, that's jobs forever, and it's renewable energy, clean energy. And the coal company wants to blow the mountain up. If they blow the mountain up, it's no longer wind viable, so you know this is permanent. It's permanent if they, if they blow up that mountain. It's permanent if we put windmills on it. You know, I see global warming as being a reason for people to start recognizing the impact of our energy usage. As a country, we do not recognize our impact on our children's future. If, if I knew that my life was being sustained by taking my children's last drink of water, I wouldn't take it. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are taking our children's future away from them. Long to hear the Bob White song. I haven't heard it in so long. With every ridge they blast away, I walk these ancient woods and pray. Let the waters run clean. Let our kids grow up fine. Let us harness the wind. As we close those killing mines. Now, this year is a drought year for us. We did not have the monsoon, very few rains. And from January, February 2010 is going to be a drought year here for us. I would suggest we need a concerted effort from every party. Everybody must cooperate. And to say that the third world will cooperate only when the first two worlds have made the reparations? No. That's just defeating the whole thing. The Prime Minister in India, he has announced already that whether America moves or not, India will go to solar. By 2050, 50% 50 of our energy would come from solar. We have to keep on raising the consciousness of as many people as possible into this activity to enhance the greater safety for the Earth. In all the years, this has become part of my faith. You see, God is here everywhere. He dwells in the heart of everything. And today I realize much more than ever that this Earth we call is the body of God. And if I could do something here, it's an act of worship. Taru Mitra means friends of trees and everything that lives and breathes shall the sun and the earth catch the breeze everyone together It started with hurricanes. Um, I positively love storms, actually. But when I realized that with climate change, these storms could intensify or become more common, that's when I started to think about the climate. For me, it really started with Hurricane Katrina, which I remember because it happened on August 29th, and my birthday is August 28th. And I remember seeing that so many people's lives were being pretty much devastated. And I was like, wow, I don't know how I can celebrate my birthday while this is going on. I didn't really actually realize that it truly was climate change I was interested in until I got to the University of Montana. And I heard they were starting this program, the climate change program. And I thought back to how 
passionate I started to feel about societies being functional through a crisis like Hurricane Katrina. And I positively love weather. I was a sailor, so wind is very important to me. But actually, it was my roommate and my best friend from college. She asked me to take the nature and society class with her last year because she wanted a friend to take it with her. And she's like, I think you oh, I'm so interested in this class, and I think you'll really, really like this. I had absolutely no clue what it was going to be before I went. I still didn't know what my major was going to be, and I didn't even know it was an environmental studies class. I went on the first day, and I was like, I love this. I absolutely love this. You cover everything, everything in that class. Back when I was in high school, looking at all this stuff, I got really, really depressed for about two weeks because I realized that there were going to be so many changes in the world and, that, and they were going to be so bad and, and I had no control of it. Then I had to take a step back from that and say, wait, I don't have any control of it right now, but I could do things in the future to offset it. For me, my biggest goal is to make one big difference. That affects a lot of people, like just even if it's just one good thing. I think a lot of opportunities and, and a lot of new perspectives are going to come out of climate change work. It's really exciting for me to talk about it because, you know, sometimes it's a little, I wonder why I go to school and then I think, oh, I'm really doing something that's important. So, yeah. It's good. It makes me feel good. If I can do one good thing for this world, for all of humanity, I will give all my heart and use it to fill the world with renewable energy. One thing I was interested in was nuclear energy. In the early 70s, Jersey Central Power and Light came to my high school to tell us about how wonderful nuclear power was. They made it sound like a solution to pollution and to energy needs. You know, they do the same thing today. And I was really excited by the science of it. I was thinking about a career in science at the time, and I just sapped it up. There weren't any anti-nuclear activists that I know about. Our school didn't bring them in. So, after that, any time I ran into an anti-nuclear activist, I would argue the pro-nuclear side. And they kept bringing up things that I didn't know about, like the nuclear, like the nuclear waste problem and the release of radiation and accidents. So, by the time Three Mile Island happened in March of 79, I was anti-nuclear. But I didn't become an activist until I heard the No Nukes album. Jackson Brown, Bonnie Raitt, Bruce Springsteen. Listening to the album and reading the booklet that went with it made me think I'm going to get off my ass and do something about it. You won't outfox the swamp fox. He never will be caught. You can muddy up the truth a while, but it never can be bought. No, it never can be bought. Colorado's been home since I was 15. I rodeoed professionally for about 20 years. I was on a horse before I could walk. I went to law school and got pretty fed up with the world, and so I went to work on a thoroughbred horse ranch raising baby horses, which I loved. I thoroughly loved. But after a few months, it just got itchy. I heard Dr. Ron Nazer asking students, what is your calling? And it occurred to me that a job is something you may do to make some money to get by. A career is what you think you're going to do with your life. And a calling is what you can't not do. And that's me. I just had to work on energy. Until something really starts to impact people, it's hard to get their attention. Have you noticed that? The drought in California this year started to get some people's attention. The fact that agriculture in the San Joaquin Valley was zeroed out for water for a long time because there was no water. 
We had a wildland fire in Boulder, Colorado last year, January 16th last year. It was 71 degrees. We had no snow. That's climate chaos. There are scary things happening, and people need to know that. At the same time, let's assume the skeptics are right. Climate change is a hoax. If all you are is a profit-maximizing capitalist, you'll do the same thing you do if you were scared to death about climate change. Because we can solve this problem at a profit. So let's go. Let's just do good business. Oh, and by the way, we solved the climate problem. There's a world of worry in the news. But there's a win-win plan and we get to choose. I made a bet and if I win, we're all gonna lose. So won't you help me lose a bottle of whiskey? Well, it was the third day when I picked her up at school. She was all discolored. Her, the bottom of her cheeks was all swelled up. Her eyes was all dark underneath. When I walked in to get her, she looked like she was just war plumb out. We left the schoolyard and I looked to See, she had her seatbelt on, and I said, Possum, buddy, you okay? And her little nickname was Possum. So I said, Possum, buddy, you okay? She was staring out over at the coal mines. She turned and looked at me, and tears was pouring down this child's face, and she said, Gramps, these coal mines are making us kids sick. And it just hit me like a sledgehammer. I was blaming myself. I was blaming the coal companies, you know. I was thinking about the chemicals they used there at the plant to clean the coal, all the dust from the silo. I was thinking about some of the shortcuts that I knew happened back there that we performed ourselves. And everything was going on through my head and I had a big lump in my throat trying to keep from crying myself. I realized I hurt my own granddaughter and I would never ever done anything like that really woke me up. I thought, well, I'm going to call the school board and I'm going to call the health department and get these kids out of here and it'd be over with. And it has turned into a five-year battle. I made a promise to them that day. Penny's a promise. Someday they Profit, but I have to say, it just doesn't seem right that we should have to fight and fight and fight for our children's lives in our own hometown. It was the I woke up that third day. It's so important how we keep our spirits up because you can't work on climate change without having your moments when you're just like, oh my gosh, you know? But minimizing the time you spend there and maximizing the amount of time you spend doing something. Maybe that's 15 minutes a month, maybe that's 15 minutes a week. We have lots of mothers with little kids and they're out there pushing their babies in a carriage and they're talking to their legislators while they're pushing the carriage, you know? And then they feel much better because they've done something. And they start to get excited about the progress we're making and everybody starts to feel better instead of everybody feeling depressed. What I try to help people understand is that it's probably too late for many things. And that just requires profound grieving. But it's never going to be too late for everything. This planet has abundant life on it. And there will always, always, always be something left worth fighting for. I've been watching the world around me change. I feel scared, then hopeful, always a little strange. I can treat the rope burns in this endless tug of war, cause there's always something left worth fighting for. There's always something left.